Hundreds of National Guard soldiers marching onto the grounds of the US Capitol this morning. A vision of a dystopian future worthy of a film set. Only this isn't Hollywood. It's Washington DC and it's real life. An extraordinary military build-up that marks the end of Donald Trump's reign and is designed to protect the life of the new president, Joe Biden, from domestic terrorists as he's being sworn in at noon tomorrow. But instead of people, a field of flags. Last night, the US National Mall lit up with 200,000 of them, each to represent an American who would have attended tomorrow's inauguration, but thanks to COVID and curfew, have been kept away. The idea, an America united, but it was a different flag on display in this exact same spot less than two weeks ago, as pro-Trump supporters gathered ahead of the deadly storming of the US Capitol, an attack designed to prevent Joe Biden becoming the next president. But the band played on in a dress rehearsal in front of the White House, where tomorrow Biden will take up residence as America's 46th president. For a man who's done nothing but crave the limelight for the last four years, Donald Trump is spending his last full day barricaded inside the White House on a street renamed after violent racial protests, locked in by concrete blocks and with one of his sacred walls now surrounding him. A fitting end, perhaps, to one of the most divisive presidencies in American history. For this is Black Lives Matter Plaza. <laughs> The street renamed last summer after Donald Trump had peaceful protesters cleared using tear gas so he could walk out and pose for a photo holding a Bible. And in a presidency where image has been everything, who will forget the pictures of children being held in cages on the Mexican border as part of his zero tolerance policy? The protection of the nation from foreign terrorists. Or the ban on people entering the United States from Muslim countries that Joe Biden is planning to immediately overturn on his first day in office. Those images are unlikely to make it into Trump's highlights video, reportedly already recorded from inside the White House and set to be released today in a last-ditch attempt to cast a positive light on his dark presidency. The past four years have been unforgettable. But we did hear from the First Lady, Melania. Not a mention of the insurrection incited by her now twice impeached husband, but a belated call for calm nonetheless. Always remember that violence is never the answer and will never be justified. Contrast that to this message. So I know this inauguration day may look a little different from years past. From Kamala Harris, the American of South Asian heritage, who tomorrow will become the country's first female black vice president. Harris and Biden will take the stage for an inauguration unlike any other in American history, surrounded by 25,000 troops and as the FBI is reportedly warning that far-right extremists could pose as National Guard members to infiltrate the ceremony. It's all a long way away from Iowa, where Joe Biden first took the stage last February in his bid to go up against Donald Trump to become the next president of the United States and listened to his confidence when I asked him this. Vice President, do you have what it takes to beat Donald Trump? You know I do. You do. 81 million votes later, he did precisely that. It's Joe Biden who'll now inhabit the White House as the former President Donald Trump heads to sunnier climes to nurse his wounds and no doubt plot his revenge. And we're speaking to Siobhan in a minute. But earlier I spoke to the Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle. He was on Capitol Hill in his office on the 6th. And he began by describing his experience inside that building. For me and my uh, three staffers, we uh, were barricaded uh, in our offices, um, our office suite, which is what the U.S. Capitol Police advised us to do. We had the lights off, um, TV off, everything dark. Uh, all the doors locked, and um, I had quietly put a pair of scissors in my pockets uh, in case the worst would happen. And then a few days later, the four of us, my three staffers and I, were on a text chain together, and I admitted to them what I did because I, I didn't tell them at the time. I didn't want to worry them. 
I later found out that every single one of my staffers ended up doing exactly the same thing uh, and also didn't didn't mention it. So we were all thinking along the same lines uh, and yet no one really wanted to say it so as to not alarm others. How extraordinary. And what does it tell you about Congress, but also about the nature of American democracy, that even after those extraordinary events that you lived through, 147 Republican congressmen and women still voted to overturn the result of a free and fair election? It's shameful. Um, for, uh, for some of them, they genuinely believe this sort of crazy, conspiratorial type nonsense but that's only a few of them. For the bulk majority, um, they were too afraid to stand up to the base of their own party, which has been lied to repeatedly by Donald Trump. And that's the kind of vote that defines a, a career. I think that they will forever have a black mark next to their name, and deservedly so. In all the years that I spent in Washington, I was always struck by the kind of rhetoric of bipartisanship, of reaching across the aisle, or trying to make friends with your political opponents. But those days are over, aren't they? I mean, this country is bitterly well, and hopelessly divided now. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't agree with you on that. I mean, we're about to inaugurate Joe Biden as president, who is someone who very much preaches from that gospel. Uh, you might recall he, so much so that he would be criticized in a Democratic primary last year because of his bipartisan instincts, there is still a strong desire among the American people to be brought together. Um, I'm not naive about how difficult that will be, but I think you will still see many um, sincerely make the attempt, including and especially President Biden. But hang on, you, you say that there's a desire to come together. According to the latest opinion poll, 65% of Republican voters don't think that President Joe Biden is the legitimate president of this country, 65%. And yet you also see opinion polls that show a, an even bigger number wants to be unified. But sometimes the electorate really gives con, uh, conflicting and um, contradictory signals. I do believe there is still a strong desire of the majority of the American people to bring us together. Secretary of State Pompeo, kind of almost in a passing a parting shot, I should say, declared that the treatment of the Uyghurs in Western China by Beijing amounts to genocide. The relationship between Washington and China is one of the most important that you're going to have to be dealing with. Do you agree with Secretary Pompeo on this judgment of genocide or not? Yes, I, I do agree. And the, uh, I think Secretary Pompeo has been the worst Secretary of State of my lifetime. There's very little diplomatic uh, about the man. But I have to say, I am glad that in his final full day in office, uh, he made this declaration. It's the right thing to do. And this is not just a matter for the United States. Uh, it's a matter for the UK and for all of the Western world to stand up finally and hold China accountable for the genocide that they are committing today against Uyghur Muslims. Representative Ball, thank you very much for coming on the program. Always a pleasure. Thank you. OK, well, let's bring in Siobhan Kennedy. Siobhan, Mitch McConnell speaking up in the Senate just over there today against President Trump is a big deal. It is hugely significant, Matt. For Mitch McConnell, the top Republican, to come out and say publicly for the first time, and I quote, the mob was fed lies, they were provoked by the president and other powerful people is huge because if McConnell goes on to convict Donald Trump in the upcoming mm. Senate impeachment trial, then he only needs to persuade 16 others to do the same for Trump to be convicted and removed and then uh, barred from standing for public office again. 16 more Republicans have to agree with Mitch McConnell, will they? Well, of course, it's a tall order. We know that Donald Trump incredibly still enjoys huge support from the Republican Party. But Mitch McConnell is, of course, now the most senior Republican mm. once Donald Trump leaves office tomorrow. So his words and the impact of his words could be huge. OK, so President Biden, who will be sworn in tomorrow uh, over there, will then move into the White House. We've got to talk about him. He was leaving Wilmington, Delaware today, his home for decades. What did he have to say? 
Well, he was very emotional. He's been leaving the airport, making uh, final farewells and thank you to his friends and family. Coming here, as you say, to become president. He was the youngest senator. He will tomorrow become the oldest president. He was very emotional. Uh, let's hear what he had to say. Look, uh, you know, you've all, uh, it's kind of emotional. Excuse the emotion. We love you all. So God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.